SBC Media. Welcome to iGaming Daily, analysing the news from the betting and gaming industry all over the globe. Supported by the Canadian Gaming Summit, bringing you Canada's premier annual conference and exhibition for gaming and sports betting senior executives from across Canada and beyond. SBC Summit Barcelona is where you can experience the entire global industry coverage under one roof. Join 10,000 industry professionals for three days of game-changing conversation and education. Get your tickets now at sbcevents.com. Amid much anticipation and many news headlines, gambling saw the review white paper as we approach a new era for UK gambling regulation. And now as we head into the summer months, things are heating up in terms of putting those proposals into place. Yet, amongst all the disciplines referenced, One that has really taken centre stage is the industry's existing framework on research, education and treatment, RET. It's become one of the most politically charged elements of UK gambling proceedings and of the outcome of the white paper. A mandatory 1% RET levy will be imposed on all operators, yet can the government harmonise a framework to satisfy the interest of diverse stakeholders on how RET funds are gathered and distributed? I'm Joe Streeter, the uh, editor of Payment Expert, and today I'm joined by Ted Ormclay and Ted Menmuir, both of SBC News, who are going to delve deeper into regulatory framework and the RET levy that is uh, likely coming. Yeah, cheers, Joe. Good to be here, mate. Joe, great intro. Yeah, glad to be here. Let's discuss some rates. Well, uh, firstly, yeah, let's let's get into it right away. And uh, I guess there's only one place to start, and that is on the current structure, a little bit of an outline of the current structure. And gambling aware as the RET commissioner. Well, what's going on at the moment, Ted, if you could? So the just sort of a simple sort of breakdown of the current uh, structure, as I understand it, is that um, so betting companies with revenue of over 250000 a year pledge 0.1% of their gross gambling yield to gamble aware which then organizers like grants and funding, uh, you know, roll out funding to various organizations across the UK that are involved in re- in RET and research, education and treatment. Um, organ- I think ch- it, companies with revenue under 250 grand pay 200, uh, just have to make a minimum contribution of 250 pounds a year. And GambleAware has been like very, very vocal throughout the Gambling Act review in calling for a, a mandatory RET levy, which we've now seen that as one of the proposals of the review. Um, and they've often t- they've often pointed to what they describe as like discrepancies and differences between the various operators. And if you notice in their, when they publish their donor list, it's often dominated by um, the Forbes largest earning firms, so yeah, Bet365, Flutter, Entain and um, William Hill, I believe, would be the other one. Um, whilst other companies are a bit more, you know, the donations between others are a bit more few and far between. Um, so yeah, and then that's so that's why they've been arguing quite heavily for this RET uh, mandatory levy, as I see it. And Ted Menmuir, anything to add on that? Yeah. So even from the off, when the gambling review was called, uh, I think. As a as a newsroom, we kind of highlighted that RET would be problematic for all stakeholders, because in its essence, it's uh, it's it's looking at the industry's relationship with how problem gambling is fu- is funded, but its relationship with that all in also how it, its relationship with the problem gambling stakeholders in themselves. So yes, the industry is donating towards a fund that then distributes towards projects, programs related to research, education and treatment. So there was always going to be some scrutiny on that. Yeah, it's incredibly important, right? And Gamble Aware, you you mentioned how sort of uh, unharmonized it's been and Gamble Aware have made um, a a few enemies here with their stance, not just, yeah, for quite a diverse list of enemies, right? It's not been smooth sailing for them on how they their proposals uh no i mean the yeah the, the, the face criticism from what i've from what i've seen in the past couple of years have faced criticism from two areas i think at first I'll, for now i'll just go into one of those and that's from sort of the public health public health bodies and public health stakeholders 
you've got the um oh what are the name again it's yeah. Matt told me wasn't there's a northern gambling clinic and social foundation social yeah. yeah social market foundation so they're they're a, they're a lobby um they're a think yeah tank. that's the one thank you on, who um on public policy yeah yeah yeah, yeah thank you just yeah just clarifying it. yeah so we've got the yeah We've got the think tank, and you've also got the um, the more the one, yeah, the actual public health institutions like, say, the Northern Gambling Clinic, and um, Dr. Mark Gaskill, uh, who I remember is, is a name that's sort of come up a lot. who has been quite vocal with some of his criticisms of the uh, of the of the current model. And the main thing they argue is that gamblerware is too dependent on the industry, and this then affects its policy making and um, sort of the rollout of its funding. Um, the, uh, there's been some criticism in the past of them saying that safer gambling messaging is like self-serving or a bit meaningless because of its connections to the industry. And um, throughout the review, they've called for sort of more transparency with regards to any connections between RET and um, and betting and gaming, and have called for more of a public health approach to um, yeah a public health approach to gambling harm as opposed to yeah what they see. That the current model, which yeah, they criticise. Yeah, so look, I mean, to, to put some more context onto this, um, I mean, this is always going to be kind of fragile ground for for the review in itself, and the reason being is that it's related to healthcare, uh, and also uh, at a time where the government is reviewing kind of every level about how welfare and healthcare infrastructures are funded throughout the UK. So this is always going to be problematic about how how can you have an industry have such a close relationship with this grant organization grant making organization such as Gamblerware. And even Gamblerware stated that they needed kind of a buffer between them and the industry. Yeah, I mean it's uh you know Shepherd in this fund is is no easy feat. It's not an easy job and as you mentioned Ted it's it's a, always going to be a very sensitive issue. Um if I could get your perspective, I guess, on uh, on whether you think they've, they've been a good shepherd of this RET fund or whether you think the times need to sort of change and we, we need a shift in how it's con- controlled and distributed. Um, I'm, I'm going to look, I'm going to give you like the, the statement's uh, opinion on this. It's impossible to judge. Uh, and it's also, you know, um, how have kind of gamblerware performed in the last five years whilst gaming has kind of the practice of gaming have have, have, have changed we've taken a lot of uh, changes because of the bgc and their instructions towards safer gambling and uh, the other thing is that there are still a lot of limitations out in in, in gambling research but to to gamblerware's credit i mean it's, it's always been very kind of forthcoming on on its flaws on its mistakes, it's always been very clear about what its um, what its policy is and what its mandate is towards the industry and towards problem gambling. Okay, yeah, that that is interesting, and I mean, you you sort of mentioned the importance of it, and uh, I I did want to get your take on just uh, whether you think, given you know we are approaching and we're very much in the midst of challenging economic times for businesses for consumers. And uh, f- from all parts, really, do you think uh, the f- the framing of this argument cha- changes because of the economic climate? And do you think we need uh, to sort of adjust? Do you think we'll adjust uh, how the the funding happens to a, to maybe increase it because of uh, the challenging period and the, the tough time for consumers? I mean, I think this is something we've discussed in some previous podcasts, and uh, yeah, I'm of the opinion that I think. This whole the cost of living crisis and all that has definitely sort of informed some areas of policy making and decision making because, um, yeah, policymakers, politicians, uh, interest groups, advocacy groups, and that are getting are quite concerned about the fact that people have got less money in their pockets and the impact that um, that you know that gambling might have on people's finances, as well as there's also been some concerns that people might try and use gambling as a way to improve their financial situation and then. You know, it ultimately did not have a positive impact, let's say. So, yeah, I'd argue that, um, yeah, the the, the the economic climate that we're in is going to is is a massive overarching factor across all of these reforms, not just RET. I think it's 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 a valid question. Uh, the other thing is, look, 
if you're going to kind of restructure the the red framework, it's can you actually replace it with anything that is better? And that that is kind of the big question here. I mean, look, it might not be perfect, but it does fund projects. It has improved insights into kind of problem gambling. And I think it's a huge call if they're going to kind of take it inwards, give it to the NHS and start from scratch. Uh, do I think, I, I think the reform in itself will come from GambleAware and its transparency and how it picks the projects. And I think that's where kind of maybe it can appease stakeholders, but they, they are in, in, a, in a tenuous position. Yes. If I can just build on what Ted said, sorry, Joe. I was just saying, yeah, I've, I've spoken to uh, RET stakeholders over the past year or so who have had a lot um, a lot of praise for the UK's problem gambling treatment network. It's, you know, various subscribers like World Class and things like that. And um, there were some concerns about, as Ted said, if it was to be, if the, if the remit, if, you know, the responsibility for choosing these projects and funding, it was to be given to the NHS. One, the NHS doesn't have the experience of treating problem gambling a lot of these organisations have. And secondly, as well, obviously, it's been under a huge amount of the NHS as an institution has been under a huge amount of pressure from the pandemic and from, as we mentioned, the economic climate. So, you know, would it really be a great idea to give even more, you know, put even more of a heavy burden on it, I guess, give it an, a, a, yet another responsibility? Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask, Ted, actually, what what is the perspective of stakeholders? I was going to ask you if they sort of needed to be one round, but it sounds very much like they're, they're on the side of uh, they're on the side of the RET and they want it there. What about in terms of gamble aware uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, the, the the rapport between stakeholders and gamble aware? How, how does that sit at the moment from your perspective? Um, I have seen some criticism of Gambleware, as as Ted mentioned, there's a transparency thing, but obviously that that criticism tends to come more from the public uh, health bodies. From the, there was, I spoke to Deal Me Out um, about a year ago, I believe, who were a, an organisation focused in Wales, who had a few, they had a few quite vocal criticisms of Gambleware, and um, they they they're of the belief that there's a lot of money that just sort of sits in its accounts and isn't used. So I think there might be there might be some areas of the RET sector who might be who might who might want to see Gambleware be more, more proactive. Might be in their in their opinion um, with with its funding, um, and uh, but yeah, yeah, that that's the main one. I think from the RET side, that's the main one. They'd probably just like to see maybe some more activity from Gambleware. But I mean, Gambleware have also responded to these criticisms in the past. You can find an open letter from Zoe Osmond on the SPC News website where she responded to uh, some of the criticism they faced. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's a tough job, <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people, and, and I think a lot of the people that are criticising it, they do have kind of a vested interest, right? And they will look at that and say, look, this is a huge charity contract right this is a lot of money um where it's i i think now if if you're a stakeholder in this argument you've got to look at like where what are we trying to improve out of the industry and its duties towards problem gambling and treatment support and also about how um problem gambling and gambling prevalence is research, which is again, I mean, I keep on going back to this. It's the weakest point per market. And I think the, here is where, you know, in the UK, you can actually look at it and say, maybe we can take like the, the, the front foot forward and say, look, this is a principle that we all need to solve. Yeah, well, Ted, speaking of uh, tough jobs and people doing them incredibly well, I did want to give you an opportunity to uh, pay tribute to Anna Hemmings, who departed uh, GamCare, obviously. Uh, yeah. T- Loosely related to our discussion, but signalling perhaps a change within the problem gambling ecosystem, and she she really did a, a fantastic job as well, right? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, when when we printed out that story, uh, we highlighted that this is you know this was she was a figurehead in uh, the whole kind of debate, how it was interpreted, how it was kind of analysed, and how it's debated, and I think she pointed towards um, that. Problem gambling, gambling addiction is a, it's a psychological disorder. It has social implications, but it has to be understood within systems and organisations. And, you know, uh, the, the work she did with uh, HM Prisons was outstanding. 
and um, you know, um, hats off to her. Uh, a great tenure as uh, CEO of Gamcare. Yeah, she's uh, an, a really uh, important legacy as well. She leaves behind from that role. You, obviously, you mentioned the uh, the work she did with uh, prisons. Uh, yeah, a, a really important legacy. So, yeah, I, I echo your sentiment there on that for sure. Yeah, I'd just add that um, obviously this is something that Gamcare pointed out themselves, but, you know, she guided them through a very probably what has been a very significant time period for both, you know, the betting industry and the RET sector with the pandemic, putting a lot of pressure on both. And then with the gambling app review and the various delays and pitfalls we've been having through that. And um, she's also, sort of, uh, she also contributed quite heavily to sort of their digitization efforts, I think, which um, obviously these days is quite important because the whole reason, the whole rationale behind the idea of the gambling app review was to bring betting, you know, in line with the digital age and all that. So, um yeah yeah she definitely was a very positive legacy of the group yeah certainly and i, I think that's a, a good note to to depart on and uh guys thanks ever so much for joining us and it's going to be really fascinating to watch how this uh really important discussion and uh development continues to unfold as well thanks everyone for your time this afternoon and anyone in canada enjoy uh enjoy have a safe flight and enjoy the conference Thank you for listening to today's episode of iGaming Daily, brought to you in conjunction with the Canadian Gaming Summit, being held at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre on the 13th to the 15th of June. If you want to find out more about some of the subjects raised today, feel free to explore any of the sites in the SBC News Network or check out the latest edition of the SBC Leaders magazine. Happy reading.